Can you guys hear me? Mic check. Uh, Donna, hi. Welcome. Hey guys, Eric, Margaret. Welcome everyone. Okay, good. All right, uh, well tonight, Lord willing, we'll take a look at a few verses around a study that I've labeled Crown of Thorns. We just went through Easter uh, Sunday not too long ago and the thought came to mind looking at the the crown of thorns that was put on the head of Jesus um, as he was uh, on the cross and ultimately was crucified have you has anyone ever thought about perhaps the the spiritual we want to take a look at the spiritual rendering of the crown of thorns which I think you might find interesting any thoughts as to what the this crown of thorns like you, we know in the Bible that nothing is done uh, by accident every image I think that God is portraying every word in the Bible has a significant spiritual meaning and that's why we want to talk about tonight Eric, can you hear me? I saw you uh, You posted something. Uh, I guess he left the room. And we'll wait for him to come back. Hey, Michael, welcome. Can you hear me? I know Donna has sound. I'm just trying to make sure that you guys are okay. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Okay, so we're talking about the crown of thorns. And we want to look at some verses surrounding... Let's see. Uh, I think the the target verse. Well, there's no. All right, Mark chapter 15, verse 17. They clothed them with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head. We want to look at Eric. Hi, welcome back. Can you hear me? We want to look at the the spiritual meaning behind the crown of thorns and the crucifixion of Christ okay good now you know there are a couple of things we want to look at we want to look at the head we've talked about the head before and just uh, as a review we'll, we'll look at some verses and who do you suppose that might be referring to I think that's also significant that they put a crown of thorns on the head on the head of Christ. Any thoughts on that? What is the head generally speaking of when it comes to uh, to the body of Christ? It's talking about Christ himself, right? He is the head of the body. Colossians 1 verse 18. He is the head of the body. Uh, the church, yeah, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Uh, yeah, I think I pronounced it correctly. Colossians 2 verse 10. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. So is it any wonder that we're looking at Christ himself on the cross and God here is focusing when it comes to the crown of thorns, he's focusing on the head. Ephesians 4 verse 15, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Okay. Uh, Revelation 14 verse 14 and I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head now you know once we look at some of these verses and Lord willing hopefully the a lot of the some of these other verses might begin to uh, make a little more sense in the context right having on his head so the head would be Christ being the the head of the body so we're, we're 
we're looking at the the actual uh, body of Christ and then uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 we read but I would have you let me post but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ so there it is again the head of every man is Christ now let me ask you the question is Christ the head of the unsaved in the church is Christ the head of the unsaved in in the church no um, you want to think about that some more why do you say that Donna why do you say that he is not the head of the unsaved well yeah yeah I mean, ultimately you know now keep in mind that when we talk about the corporate church we're talking about not no no not necessarily in judgment we're talking about the unsaved now um, even you know during the church age Christ is the head right right Christ is the head of the body remember that the uh, the for the the uh, how does that go let's see those that are not bearing fruit that he is going to uh, he is the divine and let's see let's see if I can find that verse that might help to maybe shed light on this uh, I am the vine John 15 verse 5 I am the vine you are the branches he that abideth in me and I in him the same uh, bringeth forth much fruit for without me he can do nothing and we also read about if the branches that are broken off uh, Romans 11 verse 17 and let's see let me see if I can find this ye are the branches John 15 verse 5 I am the vine ye are the branches he that abideth in me the same bringeth forth much fruit and I think it's in the following verse um, verse 6 if a man abide in me he is if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire. Okay, so what are we talking about? Right, the head of all principality and power. That includes Babylon. Well, Babylon includes also the believers prior to the separation, correct? So when we talk about Christ being the head, he is the head of every man. That's what the verse says, right? 1 Corinthians 11, 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man, doesn't say the, 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 the believers, every man here I believe is pointing to the church, the corporate body. Okay, so even the unsaved in the church, they are under the, the headship of Christ many are called but few are chosen uh, hold on one second I'll be right back okay yeah so many are called but few are chosen so that, that I think is, uh, is significant. So the head of every man is Christ. So Christ is the head. Okay, and, and that's what we're trying to uh, get across here, Lord willing. What about the thorns? Who do you suppose the thorns are pointing to? Any thoughts? So we want to look at the head. We'll look at the thorns. We'll look at crown of thorns uh, Michael says false gospels yeah uh, it's talking about Babylon I think the unsaved in the church the thorns it's talking about people not the gospel itself but the the unsaved in the body that that's Babylon right exactly Eric. so the the ones who bring the gospel and, and that's correct also uh, the unsaved they are the false gospels the false prophets so these two I think are, are one 
and the unsaved church that is Babylon. Hebrews 6 verse 8. But that which beareth thorns. Uh, hold on one second. That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing. Eric says uh, Mount, Mount Sinai is also translated thorns. Oh, okay. Okay, good. Uh, maybe you can share some verses there, Eric, later on when we're done with the study with the verses. All right, so, but that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing. Mark chapter 4, verse 7. Some fell among thorns, right? Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. I think in the context there is talking about the, the word, right? The word that is sown, and some fell among uh, good grounds, and some fell among thorns. And the thorns, again, I, I believe is pointing to the unsaved church, Babylon. Genesis 3, verse 18. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Now, you know when God cursed the earth, Adam and Eve uh, also in the beginning in cre uh, of creation, he speaks about thorns and thistles. And I remember uh, Family Radio used to talk about thorns and thistles as the earthquake, uh, tsunamis, uh, hurricane, tornadoes, and all of that. And that's God cursing the earth. While that's true, I mean, that's also true. Yeah, exactly, Mike. That, that's true, but not, it, it doesn't have anything to do, you know, with a spiritual uh, understanding, correct? And, and I used to go along with that, you know. Well, that, that seems to make sense. Uh, the, the thorns, thorns and thistles shall I bring forth to thee. Uh, it means that you're going to be subject to hurricanes and disease and viruses and all of that. Well, the Bible, the problem with that is that the Bible does not define thorns as uh, viruses and, and things of that nature. If we allow the Bible to define the Bible, we see that the thorns, ultimately, these are the, the false prophets that God allowed to come into the body of Christ. Okay, so also Numbers 33 verse 55 Uh, but if ye will not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides. Thorns in your sides. That should also remind us of another verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, where we read, um, Lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations that there was given to me in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Uh, let's see if I have a follow-up. Oh, yeah. So, this is, uh, again, if you look at the context, ultimately, I think this is pointing to the church coming into the great tribulation that's when the body is assaulted and the thorns again the unsaved in the church God allows to take control of the body and that's how the believers now they end up uh, being tried tested going through the the tribulation I will bring the third part through the fire we also read in 1 Peter 2, 20, For what glory is it if, when ye be buffeted for your fault? No, it's not talking about... <laughs> you know, I have a feeling that there are those in the post-church community, uh, in addition to family radio, if, it, if they look at this verse, they'll probably interpret it uh, the same way that I used to interpret it uh, some time back. Uh, if ye be buffeted for your fault. So those that we're talking about, May 21 and the end of the world, great earthquake, and then nothing happens, or I think that's how they, they interpreted that verse. And then now they feel that they are vindicated. They, you know, the, the, the mockers are out there. They're saying, you see, I told you so. And it's as if they are being buffeted. Again, a carnal, a very carnal uh, interpretation of uh, some of these verses. So those that are buffeted, right, the church itself is buffeted by the church. 
with the believers uh, being victim, they end up being the, the victim. Ye shall take it patiently, but what, if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. Now, again, I, I think this is a reference to the third part going through the fire. They suffer. The believers, they suffer for righteousness' sake. They suffer for Christ's sake, and they take it patiently. And patiently, here again, has to do, I believe, with uh, the believers going through the Great Tribulation. There's a great emphasis on patience. On patience. Uh, we'll come back to that though uh, later on. Another verse is coming to mind. But take a look at 1 Corinthians 4, verse 11. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted. Now, the word naked should be a clue. When is the church naked? When is the body naked? Just like Adam and Eve. When is the body naked? And has no certain dwelling place. Anyone? No covering. Right, exactly, Donna. No covering. But when does that take place? On the spiritual... Yes, exactly, Michael. In tribulation. In tribulation. The believers, they are stripped of their covering. Christ is not there. Uh, God now begins to judge the body. So there is. A, they are being buffeted. Uh, and they take it patiently, meaning that they endure the Great Tribulation. Psalm 118, verse 12. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. The fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Will destroy who? Babylon, right? The church that is destroyed ultimately as the fire of thorns. Do you see the word thorns there again? So it is, uh, again, I believe in the context is looking at what happens to the church. Uh, Babylon, Matthew chapter 13, verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. That's the tares, the, thorn, the, the, the thorns, right? The fire of thorns. The tares are gathered and burned in the fire. What fire? What fire? God's word is like fire, and it comes from the mouth of the wicked. I will make my words fire. Yeah. God's and God's wrath and who is God's wrath? God's wrath is Babylon. I will make my words fire and this people would and it shall devour them. So again, I think it's just fascinating uh, how all of this is is you know, focusing uh, ultimately on the church, what's going on in the body of Christ. Hosea chapter 9, verse 6, For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places for their silver nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. Thorns. Who are they? Again, the church. So God's judgment comes in the form of uh, releasing the false prophets. That's the judgment, right? That's the pit bull. That's Babylon. That's God's weapon against a, a hypocritical nation, against the, uh, the rebellious nation that is Israel, the body of Christ. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, Though briars and thorns be with thee, in other words, even though you're going through the the judgment of God, being exposed or subject to false prophets, false Christ, and it's only by the grace of God that we're not taken by them. And God unseals the Bible so that we see the the nature of the judgment. Uh, Though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost thou dost dwell among scorpions. So there's a synonym there again. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. So there it is again. God is talking about the house. Which house? The house of Israel, right? In the same context, he speaks of it as briars and thorns. Uh, Proverbs 22, verse 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. 
Now let me ask you this. What is the way of the froward? What is the way of the froward? Thorns and snares. So snares, again, another word. No, not talking about the date, May 21, coming and going. And, and you know, some people look at that as a snare. That's not how the Bible is defining snare, right? Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. What is the way of the froward? Who is the way in the Bible? Who is the way, the truth, and the life? Uh, let's see. And here in Isaiah, yeah, of course, Christ, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 13. Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. So you, can you see how even uh, way back with Adam and Eve when God was pronouncing judgment, it was really pointing to the church, a corporate body falling away, rebelling against Christ when God forsakes the church and tribulation. And he brings the thorns, the briars, the snares, the unsaved and the body, the wicked, the false prophets. Upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy and the joyous city. The joyous city. Uh, Eric mentioned uh, something. Uh, I think Eric did a study uh, with the word joy. There again, it's, it's got to be speaking of Christ. Christ is the joy, but in judgment it is anti-Christ. It is a joyous city, not that there is salvation there, but because the name of Christ is in view. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 6, And I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come, there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Let's see one more verse, Proverbs 26 verse 9, As the thorn goeth up and the in the hand of a drunkard, so is a parable in the mouth of fools. Okay, so even the word drunkard here, if we allow the Bible to uh, define the terms, we'll see ultimately it is pointing to the, the unsaved church, the false prophets. Any questions? Any questions? We're looking at crown of thorns that was placed on Jesus at the time that he was crucified crown of thorns and we're trying to make sense out of it because we know the, the crown has uh, meaning thorns have meaning in the Bible God defines the terms the head has meaning so we, we, we got to come up to some, some, sort, some type of uh, conclusion and trying to pick up the spiritual gospel the message of the gospel alright so crown of thorns which I believe is pointing to the rule of Babylon over the head. Can you see that? The rule of Babylon. So in other words, when Christ was hanging on the cross, when they put the crown of thorns on his head, that was a picture that would have been a picture of the body itself in the time when God judges the church. It is the, the reason that Christ is suffering, the reason that that crown of thorns is, is served to uh, cause blood, uh, cause him tremendous uh, agony, anguish, and pain. That's the church, the body of Christ, the thorns, the briars, the snares. They are now ruling over the head of the body. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> they are ruling over the head of the body so the crown of thorns is pointing to those that have control of the church in tribulation and ultimately in judgment i mean again that to me is fascinating because only god can uh, you know be 
consistent like that when it comes to uh, everything else that we've looked at in the Bible. Everything has to have meaning. Mark chapter 15, verse 17. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. That's the church. The suffering of the head. The head. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. The head is Christ, but in tribulation and judgment, it is Antichrist. It is still Christ because it's those that are coming with the Bible. They're coming in the name of Christ. Matthew 27, 29. When they had plated a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. So it's not a coincidence that God is uh, making reference to the word head. And a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, can you see the connection there? Can you see the connection that, first of all, they put a crown of thorns and they are mocking him? How does that fit in to the Great Tribulation? Remember Psalm 35, verse 16? Hypocritical mockers and feasts, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. So they are mocking the body of Christ. That's what happens in tribulation. That's what happens when God forsakes the church. They are mocking the body. They're, they're mocking. It, it is the body of Christ that is, and in, at this point in tribulation, it includes both what? It includes both the wheat and the tares. The whole body is in agony. The whole body is suffering. Matthew chapter 20 verse 19. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. You see the tie in there? So first they put the crown of thorns on his head. And then they mock him. Hail king of the Jews. Hypocritical mockers, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge. So mocking has to do with the church coming with a what? A different gospel. The church coming or thinking that it is it is acting on behalf of Christ, but in reality they are mocking. They are the crown of thorns. You see that the church is the crown of thorns. Yeah, amen. So they are the crown of thorns. That's why they are uh, causing damage to the body. They, they're bringing uh, a hurt to Christ. The, and in Mark chapter 10, verse 34, And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him. Well, again, and the body dies in tribulation. Remember that? The two witnesses? Eric writes, we are the crown of thorns before we are saved. Yes. Yes. Amen. The body is the crown, uh, more specifically Babylon, the, the unsaved in the church, that is killing the head of Christ, or the head of the body, who is Christ. Uh, Matthew 27, 31. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. Now obviously uh, everything has a spiritual meaning, but you know the Bible is so has so much that we, we, we have to take it one step at a time, one word at a time, one context at a time. And make sure that we follow it through the whole Bible to pick up the spiritual meaning. And some, some, perhaps another time we can, you know, we'll look at the robe. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I touch on that a little bit in the next uh, few verses. Donna writes, I, I thought that the false prophets will mock the true believers. Yeah, but not, not in the sense that you're thinking, that Donna. It's not a, a literal mocking. Does that make sense? That's what I, I mentioned before. There are those that are looking at um, scourging and mocking, uh, hypocritical mockers, and they're thinking, oh, well, that's 
you know, well, we, we, you know, we're passing our tracks and people are laughing at us. People are, are, uh, you know, not taking us seriously. And, and that's how many people interpret mocking. That's how I used to interpret it. But more specifically, though, more spiritually, it is all about uh, the unsaved, the false prophets. They're coming, you know, in essence, what they're doing. And they, they don't realize that. And see, that's a scary thing. They don't realize that. Eric says that was family radio. Right, right. I, I learned that, uh, you know, back then from family radio. Michael says, I thought so too at one time. Yeah. But you see, the, the, the scary thing is that the church does not recognize that. They don't, you know, say, oh, I'm mocking Christ. We have to see that by God's grace. God is pointing the finger at them <clears throat> because of their unfaithfulness, because of the falling away, the apostasy of the church. So spiritually, in essence, they are mocking Christ, so they're mocking the believers. And it, it would have to be, you know, with the fact that they're coming as antichrist, and they are mocking. Remember what happened with Christ on the cross? They said, what did the soldiers say to him? Uh, or those that were surrounding the, the cross? You know, they said, well, if you, if you really are the Son of God, then come down from the cross and we'll believe you. And it's all satanic. It's all antichrist. All those that are round about, uh, the believers included, I think, there is a mocking going on, <clears throat> but then ultimately God, because God made payment for the sins of the elect, they in turn, they are not judged in this mocking. At first they, they were, that they're a part of the judgment, uh, but then God begins to separate them from the terrors. So yeah, very uh, good observation. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Michael writes, just like the two thieves, both were mocking Christ. Yeah, exactly. So they, they mocked, okay, and, all, and then one of them did become saved. So we see the gospel there. The number two and then the the separation yeah thanks for pointing that out so that that's uh, what mocking would be spiritually right we read in John 19 verse 5 then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said unto them unto them behold the man the crown of thorns and the purple robe I think I have, let me see, uh, Matthew 27, verse 28, and they stripped him of his, and put on him a scarlet robe. And like I said, I'm not going to go into details on the robe itself, because everything, if it, you know, just a word by itself, we have to follow it through the whole Bible, and, and there could be a lot to, uh, to take in. So that's why we have to focus, if we do any kind of a study, we have to focus on one text uh, at a time and then try to follow that through the Bible. And, and then perhaps uh, we'll look at the spiritual meaning of the road. But the same would be in view, I, I suspect, okay, in, in the same context. Uh, Luke 23, verse 11, in Herod with his men of war, set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe. So you see, the robe there has to do uh, with the the mocking, the agony, the, the, the condition, the spiritual condition of the church. Christ now has a scarlet robe, a gorgeous robe, a purple robe, and, you know, so to speak, that, that is for his funeral, that is for the uh, pointing to the condition, the spiritual condition of the church. Esau was scarlet red. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's a good uh, observation there too, Donna. Because Esau spiritually is the would be pointing to Babylon, would be pointing to the unsaved church, and they are the ones that are mocking him. So yeah, that that would seem to make sense. All right. Uh, any questions? I want to look at one final category. We'll just go through a, a, a couple of verses 
looking at the various crowns and uh, try to you know pick up the the language of judgment and salvation there in Isaiah 28 verse 3 the crown of pride now crown usually has to do with a symbol right it's a symbol of strength uh, a symbol of, uh, of joy depending on the context so crown therefore can be pointing to it is Christ but depending on the context it can also point to Antichrist and in the case of uh, the crown of thorns that would be Antichrist it would have to be Babylon right which is also the crown of pride the drunkards of Ephraim Isaiah 3 verse 17 therefore the Lord will smite him with a scab the crown of the head there it is again the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion what is the crown of the head Babylon right it would have to be Antichrist Deuteronomy 33 verse 20 and of Gad he said blessed be he that enlargeth Gad he dwelleth as a lion and teareth the arm with the crown of the head notice tearing the arm with the crown of the head again who is the crown of the head well it is the wrath of God it is Babylon that God is using in judgment to tear to destroy uh, the wicked John 19 verse 2 and the soldiers plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head so there it is the crown of pride crown of the head the crown of thorns Uh, Jeremiah 2 verse 16 as the children of Noth and Tahippens Te Te how you pronounce it Tahippenes have broken the crown of thy head now why would this be the case how can you break the crown of the head when Christ is the head when Christ is the head now this is a language of salvation I believe right but notice the language here carefully also the children of Noph and Tahippanes have broken the crown of thy head so substitute here for example crown of thy head what would you put in its place to try, to try and get a better feel a better understanding of the verse have broken the crown of thy head have broken what Babylon right Babylon because in the context it is salvation so to, to, to break the crown of the head it would have to relate to Antichrist right those who are associated with Christ those who come in the name of Christ in the day of judgment Isaiah chapter 62 verse 3 thou shalt also be called I'm sorry uh, thou shalt also be a crown of glory who is that a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord so you see the contrast there between the crown of glory and the crown of thorns right and context is uh, important 2nd Samuel 14 verse 25 looking at the latter part of the verse uh, from the soul oh, let me read the whole verse but in Israel there was none to be uh, so much praise as Absalom for his beauty from the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head now in this context here Absalom uh, is a picture or would appear to be a picture of Christ just like Solomon given the proper context is also a picture of Christ and it says here from the sole of his foot even to the crown of his head there was no blemish in him so that would have to be the context here is indicating salvation first Peter 5 verse 4 and when the chief shepherd shall appear ye shall receive a crown of glory who is that ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away 
Is this talking about Christ or Antichrist? Anyone? Revelation chapter 2 verse yeah thank you Donna it's talking about Christ a crown of glory uh, Revelation 2 verse 10 fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer behold the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried that's the tribulation ye shall have tribulation 10 days All right the number 10 there pointing to the the judgment of the tribulation uh, be thou faithful unto death in other words uh, the death of salvation, the death of Christ. Remember those that are died, you know, they are buried uh, with him and they are risen uh, unto life. And in this context here, the death would have to be the death of salvation. And I will give thee a crown of life. So there it is again, crown of life, pointing to the salvation that the believers find in Christ. Uh, when they are separated from Babylon. And there appeared, Revelation 12, 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Who is that? A crown of 12 stars. It would have to be speaking of the body of Christ again, correct? A woman clothed with the sun, uh, and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars and finally Psalm 21 verse 3 for thou preventest him with the blessings of goodness thou setteth a crown of pure gold on his head talking about the salvation the believers find in Christ they receive a crown of pure gold so again, the context here would indicate that it has to do with the believers coming out of tribulation. And, and now they forever, they, in, they inherit uh, eternal life. They inherit uh, the new heavens and the new earth. They are separated from Babylon. Now what happens from there, I have no idea. What happens? And, and that's what a lot of people have been trying to get to. You know, well, what happens beyond the salvation, the spiritual uh, salvation that the believers receive well one problem I think is that if you're looking for a physical revelation of Christ then you miss the the spiritual salvation uh, that is the separation of wheat and tares uh, and therefore they are going to you know we, we try to look at the Bible and see if we can find language that would point us to a uh, a, a literal manifestation of Christ. Now again, I, I don't, I'm not saying that there won't be, or that God is not going to bring an end to the world, but it's just that uh, I don't think we have uh, language in the Bible, language that is spiritual, uh, I, I don't think we can use to try and determine how that's going to play out. Okay, let me just go ahead and post a conclusion and then we'll open for discussion. Bear with me one second. Okay, there it is. God appears to be equating Christ's crown of thorns with the church and tribulation under Babylon that eventually led to his death. In fact, crown of thorns is Babylon. The thorns would seem to point to how the head, that is Christ, was treated by his own people again very important those who put the crown of thorns okay ultimately those who put Christ to death are the uh, the Jews you know his own people he came onto his own and his own received them not okay so just before the the body died so spiritually speaking again uh, I believe it has to do with the church coming into the great tribulation subject to the crown of thorns subject to Babylon the body, the whole body is subject to Babylon uh, and the suffering of Christ, the suffering of the, the body of Christ and tribulation. Okay, hold on one second.